Suspense. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Mr. Van Johnson in The Defense Rests, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Hey, Harlow, much as I hate to mention this on radio, I was watching television the other night. Shh, Hap, we're on the air. Yeah, well, people gotta know this. I found out that cars, trucks, and buses equipped with ordinary spark plugs kick up a frightful fuss with TV pictures. Well, that's not true of Autolite resistor spark plugs. Wonder of wonders, these wide gap whizzes cut down television cut-ups. They sure let your engine idle smoother, too, don't they? Yes, Autolite resistor spark plugs let your engine idle smoother, give better performance on leaner gas mixtures, actually save you gas, and they have 200% longer electrode life. Autolite resistor spark plugs are backed by the research and engineering know-how of Autolite, leader in resistor-type spark plugs. Get Autolite resistor spark plugs from your Autolite dealer tomorrow. You're always right with Autolite. Oh, a reminder, suspense on television may be seen on many stations throughout the country every Tuesday night. And now, with the defense rests and with the performance of Van Johnson, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. A People versus Robert Tasker. The defendant charged under the indictment with murder in the first degree. Is counsel for the defense prepared to proceed? I am, Your Honor. Very well, Mr. Krieger. Your Honor, if the court please, I think it's fitting that for a moment I should speak openly to Your Honor and to the jury on a matter which has a substantial bearing on this case. I refer to the rather unique relationship existing between myself and the defendant, Robert Tasker. It is true that in my interest in him and in his fate is far greater than the normal interest of a lawyer in his client. This interest might reasonably be described as fatherly. And yet I ask your honor and the gentlemen of the jury to think of me in all fairness and without bias simply as a lawyer defending his client. My name is Robert Tasker. I am sitting in a courtroom on trial for murder. As Mr. Krager, my lawyer, stands there now telling the judge and the jury about me and about him, I can't help thinking that if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be here today. And thinking what an irony it is, too, because Mr. Krager is the only friend I've ever had in the world. I'm an ex-con. My sentence was for 10 years. After I'd been there about a year, I began to write. Just short stories, little things. I had lots of time. Finally, I sent one to a magazine, and they published it. Mr. Krager happened to read it. He wrote to me. Then he came to see me. He remembered my case. He said he'd try to help me. Then one day, I was called to the warden's office. Hello, Robert. Hello, Mr. Krager. Robert, I've got some good news for you. I've got your parole. You're free. Well, you happy? Sure, it's just that I still don't quite believe it. It's official, Tasker. Here are your papers. Papers? Oh, that'll make everything easy, won't it, Warden? Passport to a brilliant future, ex-con. Robert, I know it's going to be a little hard to adjust at first, but uh, there's a job in my office. Thanks, Mr. Krager, but I don't want charity, even from you. Oh, it isn't charity, Robert. I need a clerk in my office, or I wouldn't have offered you the job. You don't have to stay if you don't want to. But you'll be doing me a great favor if you try it. Well, I guess I owe you at least one favor. Well, Tasker, goodbye and good luck. Just remember that what's happened up here is water over the dam. Don't hold any grudges. I don't hold any grudges, Warden. There's one man I hate, that's all. A man you hate, Robert? His name is Arthur Hines, and I hate him. It's simple as that. Forget it, son. Hines was D.A., then he was just doing a job, that's all. He had nothing against you. He was doing a job, all right. Oh, Robert, you mustn't feel that way. You'll get along with Hines, all right. Get along with him? In the office. Well, didn't I tell you? Arthur Hines is my new partner. Well, it certainly threw me for a second to hear I was going to be working side by side with Hines. But, well, I made up my mind to play ball. The work wasn't hard, and I was able to do some writing on the side. 
Mr. Krager always encouraged me in that. And Peggy helped me a lot, too. She helped me to believe in myself. All that time, I never saw Mr. Hines. He was out of town or something. And then one day, he came back. I was nervous at the idea of seeing him. He was in his office with someone. He'd come in the private entrance. Mr. Krager was in that day, too, in his own office. I was out in the anteroom with Peggy by the switchboard. Krager and Hines. I'm sorry Mr. Hines is in conference now. Can you call back later? About half an hour. Thank you. But what's he really like, Peggy? I've never seen him except that time in court. Oh, he's all right, I guess. Well, how do you mean all right? How do I know what he's like? I just work here. I'm not married to the man. Okay, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Robert. I guess I'm kind of jumpy today. Well, what's the matter, Peggy? It isn't anything. Nerves. You've been that way ever since Hines came in. Mr. Hines? How could he have anything to do with it? I don't know. You understand the English language? No. Now get out. Don't give me that, Hines. You've either got it or you know who has. I don't know anything about it and I don't want to know. Don't you think I've got enough trouble nowadays keeping mugs like you out of the pen without being a fence for what you stole? Now get out of this office and stay out. Okay. But I'll be back. $50,000 is a lot of money. Well, what do you want? Why, I... Uh, Robert works here, Mr. Hines. My name's Robert Tasker. Didn't Mr. Craig... I knew I'd seen you before. You're that punk kid I sent up to San Quentin. It was for ten years. What do you mean, you're working here? Mr. Krager got me out. He gave me a job. A job of what? Snooping outside my office? I wasn't... Don't talk back to me, you dirty little jail rat. Why, you... Robert, don't. Let go. Don't. No. Leave me alone no. here. No. Robert. Let me go. Stop it, both of you. Calm down. What's the matter? What's the idea of bringing this ex-con into the office, Max? Isn't it bad enough to have to work with criminals all day? Robert is not a criminal. He's here because I want him to be here. Because I believe in him and trust him. Well, I don't like anyone hanging around outside my door when I'm having a private conference, that's all. Now, look. Robert Tasker's one of the finest, most gifted young persons I've ever known. I want him to get along here. And I want him to get along with you, too, Arthur. You understand? I can get along with anyone. Well, sure you can. Everything forgotten now, eh? Start right off with a clean slate, eh? Sure. Well, I'll see you later in the afternoon, Max. Well, Robert, uh, come into my office for a minute, will you? Sure. My boy, I'm terribly sorry. I, I don't know how to begin to apologize. Why should you apologize? I just don't like him. He doesn't like me. No, no, Robert, you're wrong there. It's just that things have been happening lately to upset him. Like this fellow Marvin and his $50,000. Yeah, what's that all about? Well, there's a poor fellow who's been in prison for the last five years. He claims he had quite a lot of money when he went in. He thinks Hines hijacked it on him, huh? Well, he says he left it with a pal of his, and later the pal was killed in a gunfight. Gallucci, you remember the case? Yeah, I remember something about it. Well, anyway, just before he died, Gallucci told somebody he'd left the money with Hines. That's how the story goes, anyway. But you know how these things travel on the grapevine? It's all nonsense, of course. That guy meant business just the same. Well, that probably explains the whole thing. Hines was a little scared. <laughs> but don't let it worry you, Robert. You will stay, won't you? Well... Believe me, it's for the best. Well, okay. That's the spirit. And any other little troubles, you just bring them to me, will you? Thanks. Well, I guess I'd better relieve Peggy on the board. Keep your chin up, son. Sure. I'm sorry I kept you waiting, Peggy. That's all right. Well, what's the matter? Shh, please don't say anything. Peggy, what is it? Robert, I'm scared. Scared of what? Hines? Don't be silly. No, no, it's not him. Well, what is it? Rob, I shouldn't, but I have got to tell someone. Sure you have, but take it easy now. What is it? I've never told anyone before. Neither Mr. Hines nor Mr. Craig know what. I'd die if they did. You wouldn't tell anyone, would you? Of course I won't. Come on, spill it. You saw that man who was in here who, who was arguing with Mr. Hines about the $50,000? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's true. There is $50,000 somewhere. Yeah? Well, how do you know all this? I know. I'm scared. Robert, he, he's a killer. That guy? Uh, well, I wouldn't be surprised, but how do you know? Because he's my brother. <laughs> I had a hunch to lamb out of there right then. I knew something was going to happen. But I hated to run out on Peggy when she was in a jam and might need help. And I didn't want to let Mr. Craig down either. 
I promised I'd stay until I could get sort of a start on my own. And he was the only man in all my life that ever treated me like a, like a person instead of a thing. So I stayed. I didn't have any more trouble with Hines. We didn't speak to each other much. There wasn't any need to. And he was out of town most of the time anyway. He was out of town until that day. The day that he died. Gregor and Hines. I'm sorry he's out of town. You might try later this afternoon. Yes, I'll tell Mr. Hines. Say, Peggy. Uh-huh? Do you know when Mr. Crager will be in? He didn't say. He's still open. Harry. Where is he? Who? You know who? Hines. Oh, Harry, I told you not to come. I begged you not to. Sure, sure. Always a little pal. Always a little... Hey, wait a minute. What does this guy know? I, I, I told him that we were... that you were my brother. But nobody else? Yeah, Sure. Okay, what do I care? I only care about one Harry, thing. Harry, you promised me you wouldn't come up here. Where's Hines? I don't know. He's out. Then I'll wait till he comes back. Harry, you mustn't. I'm staying. I'll get it out of him. <sighs> Harry, your sister says you should leave. You keep out of this, punk. I don't like that word, pal. Look, Robert, listen, w w will you watch the board for a few minutes? Sure. It's lunchtime anyway. Harry, Harry, I I've got some things I want to talk over with you privately. What things? Uh, about Hines and, you know... Come on, we'll, we'll go downstairs to the grill in the lobby. You wouldn't be trying to ease me out of here, would you? No, no, honest, I, I've got to talk to you, Harry. Come on. Okay. Now, you listen, pal. Yeah? If Mr. Hines comes in, you tell him I was here. And you tell him he better come across, or else. Is that all? That's enough, isn't it? He'll know what I mean. Sure. After they left, I just sat there. With this guy, Harry, feeling the way he did, even if he was a screwball with a jackpot like $50,000 kicking around somewhere, no matter who had it, I knew it was a cinch there was going to be a blow-off. And I knew I was going to be right in the middle of it. I didn't know how then, but I knew I was. A guy with a record always is. And there wasn't a thing I could do about it. So I just sat there waiting, waiting for trouble to happen. <laughs> Crager and Hines. Hello, Robert. This is Max Crager. Oh, yes, Mr. Crager. Are you there alone, Peggy, out to lunch? Uh, yes. Yes, she is. Oh, well, it can't be helped. I'm in a hurry. i tell you what I want you to do. Yes, sir. I'm across the street in the courthouse, Judge Andrews Court, the Ellsworth case. There are some notes I've got to have over here right away. They're in my own handwriting, pencil, and clearly marked Ellsworth. Yes, sir. You'll find them in Mr. Hines' office, the pages all clipped together. I don't know exactly where in his office, but uh, keep looking. Keep looking until you find them. All right, sir. Uh, then bring them over to me right away. Got it? Uh, yes, sir. I'll be waiting for you. I left the switchboard and went into Mr. Hines' office. I started looking around for the notes. I looked everywhere. I looked on top of the desk first, and then I looked in all the drawers. Then I looked in the filing cabinet. I even tried to look in the safe, but it was locked. Then I stopped and sort of looked around the room to see if there was anything I'd missed. And I noticed some yellow papers on top of the bookcase. I reached up and took them down. I was standing there with my back to the private entrance, looking the papers over to be sure they were the right ones. What are you doing in here? Mr. Crager wanted some papers, Mr. I Hines. thought I told you to stay away from my office. What are you snooping around here for? Mr. Crager told me to look in here for the... Yeah, there's something mighty funny going on around this office. There's nothing funny. Mr. Crager told... I say there is. What's the switchboard girl doing sneaking around the lobby with Harry Marvin? They tried to avoid me, but I saw them. First, the switchboard girl turns out to have a crazy ex-convict for a boyfriend, and now... That's a lie. He's her brother. Her brother? Oh, so that's it. Oh, I shouldn't have said that, Mr. Hines. I don't know anything about oh, it. Oh, you don't? Well, I do. I get it now. I knew there was something, and all of a sudden, I get it. Mr. Hines, there's, there's nothing to get. So the girl and her brother go down to the lobby and set themselves an alibi because they know I'll suspect them and get you to do their dirty work for a nice fat cut. Please, Mr. Hines, don't talk that well, way. Well, you didn't find it, did you? And you won't. Now you get out of here, you little punk. I said don't talk you that way. You dirty, thieving little... Fat. I told you not to talk that way. He fell and just lay there. For a minute, I didn't know what to do. Then I knew I'd have to tell Mr. Crager. I knew I was all washed up there anyway. I couldn't very well expect even a man like Mr. Crager to choose between his law partner and me. And I couldn't stay in the same office with Mr. Hines after what had happened. Somehow, I wanted to tell Mr. Crager myself before anyone else did. I went out to the switchboard and dialed the courthouse number. Judge Andrews. 
Lewis Court, Johnson speaking. I want to speak to Mr. Max Crager. This is his office calling. Well, I don't see him around here right now. The court's in recess. Uh, I know, but try to locate him, will you? It's important. Okay, hold the line. I sat there waiting for them to find Mr. Crager. And all of a sudden, I remember the papers he wanted. I cut off the call on the switchboard. I went back to Mr. Hines' office. He was just lying there, just as I'd left him. And yet there was something different. I went over and looked at him more closely. His face was a terrible gray color. I touched his wrist, feeling for his pulse. And next, th next thing I knew, I was down on my knees, tearing open his collar. But even then, I knew it wasn't any use. Mr. Hines was dead. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Van Johnson in The Defense Rests. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hey, Hap, did I tell you about my hobby? Hobby? Yeah, I collect old-fashioned narrow-gap spark plugs that have been replaced with smooth-firing wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. You got many of the old-fashioned plugs? Many. I've got millions. That's because millions of Autolite resistor spark plugs are in use today. And that means millions of masterful motorists are enjoying the bountiful benefits of these wide-gap wonders. Did you say benefits, Harlow? Yes, sir, e. Hap. The new wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs have 200% longer electrode life. And in addition, they give smoother idling and better performance on leaner gas mixtures, which means actual gas savings. Also, famous Autolite resistor spark plugs reduce spark plug interference with radio and television reception. Years of research and the engineering know-how of the leader in resistor-type spark plugs are behind the famous Autolite resistor spark plugs. Get a set today from your nearby Autolite dealer. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to a Hollywood soundstage Van Johnson in The Defense Rests, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I don't know how long I stood there in the room. It might have been hours. It might have been only a couple of minutes. I just stood there, my mind dazed, and yet at the same time, racing through a thousand half-formed plots and schemes of escape, of what I could say, of, of some way out. Then the switchboard began to buzz with an incoming call. It sort of brought me to my senses. More out of habit than anything else, I went out to answer it. Crager and Hines. Robert, you still there? Mr. Crager, I... Where are those notes? Haven't you found them yet? Yes, I found them all right. Well, bring them over here. I need them right away. Mr. Crager, I... Robert, what's the matter with you? I just killed Mr. Hines. Pretty soon the police came. I called them myself. Mr. Crager said it was the only thing to do, and I knew he was right. He said he'd be in touch with me as soon as he was through at court. I didn't know what he could do... I didn't think there was much he'd want to do, but it made me feel better to have him talk that way. The police took me across town in a squad car. I knew what I was in for. The police don't like ex-convicts, particularly one that they think has been mixed up with murder. Yeah, you're just making it hard for yourself, Tasker. I've told you what happened. In a pig's eye you have. I don't have to talk if I don't want to. No. I'm waiting for Mr. Crager. I told you that. Crager? What do you think he's going to do for you? I don't know, but he told me he'd come down. Oh, sure, of course, he'll come down to give evidence against you. Ah, oh, now, listen, Tasker, if you give a full confession, we may be able to get a break for you. Yeah, Mr. Crager's outside. He wants to see you. Oh, yeah? Okay, send him in. Okay, Mr. Crager. Hi, right, boys. Hi. Hello, Robert. Hello, Mr. Crager. They've been treating you all right? Uh, pretty good. Fine. I don't like to have people get rough with my clients. Your what? You heard me, Captain. While you're at it, you might as well take those handcuffs off him because from this moment he's out on bond, released in my custody. I've got the papers right here. Say, are you crazy? Certainly not. I simply don't believe the boy did it, that's all. Look, Craig, why try to kid us? It's an open and shut case. Tasker's the only person who had the opportunity. The only one who had a motive. Uh-uh. Well? Not to speak ill of the dead, Captain, and although Arthur Hines was my law partner... It's unfortunately true that quite a number of people at least thought they had a motive. Oh, sure. So maybe this other ex-con, Harry Marvin, had a motive. Maybe even the dame on the switchboard had a motive, for all I know. But they couldn't have done it. 
Fifty people saw him together downstairs in the lobby of the building at the time the murder was committed. Oh, you've talked to them, have you? Listen, this kid admits he had a quarrel with Hines. He always hated him anyway. He admits he hit him. So he picks the paperweight off the desk, smashes him over the head. Wait a minute. You didn't say anything about that, Robert. Oh, I didn't even know about it before. I didn't hit him with any paperweight. Oh, stop it, will you? The back of the man's head was bashed in with that paperweight, and this kid's fingerprints were all over it. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> this is murder, mister. I'm sorry. But you'll find out if you ever try to bring this boy to trial for killing Arthur Hines with a paperweight. Listen, Craig, you're not going to make a chump out of me. This boy is going to be indicted for murder, he's going to be convicted of murder, and he's going to burn for murder. Indicted, convicted, burned. Three promises. And the first one's already happened. The second one? Well, even I can see we don't stand much chance. And the third one, I just try not to think about. But there is Mr. Crager up before that jury, acting as though it was an absolute certainty that I'd be cleared. Pleading for me as though I were the only guy in the world because, well, that's the kind of a guy he is. It is my firm conviction that when you have heard this boy's story from his own lips and gained an insight, as I have, into the depth and integrity of his character and spirit, you will also believe him innocent. He is innocent. Now, Robert, I'll ask you to take the stand, please. Raise your right hand, please. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, sir, help you, God? I do. Please be seated. Now, Robert, just for the record, will you tell the court your full name? Robert Loring Tasker. Your age? 24. Your mother and father are dead. You have no living relatives? No, no one. Now, before you begin your story, there are one or two extremely important points that I particularly wish to emphasize to the court. Now, tell me, Robert, how long was it between the time you quarreled with Mr. Hines and the time you went back into his office and found him dead? Not long. Six or seven minutes, perhaps. Six or seven minutes, eh? Long enough for someone to have entered Mr. Hines' office by the back entrance, struck him, and left again. Now, concerning this famous paperweight the prosecution has talked so much about, I uh, have it here. Do you recognize it? Yes. It was always on Mr. Hines' desk. Now tell me, when you went in his office at my order to look for certain papers, you touched this paperweight, did you not? Yes, I, I touched just about everything on the desk. Exactly. In other words, your fingerprints would be found not only on this paperweight, but on practically everything else in the room. Yes, they would. In due course, Your Honor, we shall demonstrate that such is in fact precisely the case. Now, Robert, when Mr. Hines found you in his room, he was irate and highly suspicious, was he not? Yes, he was. In fact, he even suspected that there was some plot against him, involving Peggy, the switchboard girl, and a client of his named Harry Marvin. Yes, he did. You denied this, saying that, in fact, they were brother and sister. Yes. How is... Yes, that's right. You denied the charge of a plot, saying that Peggy and Harry Marvin were brother and sister. Then Mr. Hines went so far as to accuse you of stealing. Your Honor. Yes, your Honor, there's something I've, I've just thought about, some new evidence. I'd like a few minutes alone with my lawyer. Well, if counsel has no objection. Oh, Robert, what is it? It's just something that I think I ought to tell you in private. Oh, very well. Uh, if Your Honor, please, then. Uh, by all means. Perhaps you'd like to use my chamber. Thank you, Your Honor. Come along, Robert. Well, you didn't have to lock the door, Robert. I want it to be private. All right. But, Robert, you mustn't worry like this. Let me do the worrying. They can't convict you if there's a reasonable doubt. That's the law. And there is a reasonable doubt. Someone did come in and hit Hines in those six or seven minutes. It must have been that way. Yes, I know. Well, of course you do. We've been over the whole thing. Now, let's go back into the courtroom. Mr. And... Craker, there's something I haven't told you. Something you haven't told me? What? It's a little thing, but it's kind of important because it's something I never told anyone except a dead man. Well, what is it? I never told anyone that Peggy was Harry Marvin's sister, except Mr. Hines. 
Well, now, Robert, don't you think that's a little trivial? No, because you know about it. You just said so in the courtroom. Well, And I... there's only one way you could have found out. You must have been in your office when I had the fight with Hines and heard me tell him. Oh, Robert, that's ridiculous. Oh, no, it isn't, because you're right. Somebody did come in in those six or seven minutes and kill Hines. You did. You're crazy. It must have been for that $50,000. You hijacked the hijacker. And you knew they'd pin it on me with my record. I'm not going to stay here and listen oh, to any such nonsense. Oh, yes, you are, because I'm going to get the truth out of you. You planned it that way, didn't you? You sent me into Hines' office that day, and you probably sent him. Robert, I... And you figured you were such a hot lawyer, you might even get me off for 20 years or so to ease your dirty conscience, didn't you? Talk, Craig! I... You won't get any... Why are you using violence with me? No! Talk! Now, now, wait a minute. Even if I did confess, it wouldn't hold up as evidence. Talk! Listen, we'll postpone the trial. I, I can get you out of the country. I, I'll give you money. That's all I wanted to know. Talk! You did it, didn't you? You killed him! Stop! Talk! Stop it! Stop it! That's where you were when I phoned you at Robert. They couldn't find you, weren't you? Robert! You were killing Hines, weren't you? Stop it! Stop it! Yes. Yes, I did it. Okay. I killed him. I guess we can unlock the door now. Uh, what's going on here? Grab him, Your Honor. He's crazy. He attacked me. So I gather. He even accused me of murder. Yes, we heard him. Tell me, Craig, where were you when this boy phoned you here at court? When they couldn't find you? Why, why, Your Honor, as a matter of fact, I was right here. Right in this very courtroom. I, I had some work to do. I, I wanted privacy. Your court was in recess. You were out of town. Uh, yes, I know, um... You say you were right here in this room? Yes, that's right. And then, Craig, uh, there's something you don't know. Uh, what? On the day of the murder, the floor of this room was being repainted. And the paint, Mr. Craig, uh, was quite wet. Your Honor, the defense rests. <laughs> Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Van Johnson. Ever do crossword puzzles, Harlow? Sure, Hap. Need a word? Yes, a five-letter one meaning smooth firing. Why, that's easy. A-L-R-S-P. A-L-R-S-P? That's no word. Pronounce it. I can't. But A-L-R-S-P, Autolite resistor spark plugs, are the newest sensation built for your car. They let your engine idle smoother, run better on leaner gas mixtures, actually save you gas. Autolite resistor spark plugs are just one of more than 400 products made by Autolite for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 Autolite plants coast to coast. Autolite also makes complete electrical systems for many of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, coils, generators, starting motors, distributors. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, folks, don't accept electrical parts that are supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite Original Factory Parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. <music> Next Thursday, for suspense, Edward Arnold will be our star. The play is called Account Payable. And it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Tonight's suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. The Defense Rests was written by Roland Brown, adapted for radio by Robert L. Richards. Van Johnson appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of The Red Danube, starring Walter Pidgeon, Ethel Barrymore, and Peter Lawford. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Edward Arnold. And buy Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite staple batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. The new National Guard offers men an unequal opportunity for part-time military training at home. Get the facts, then get in the Guard. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>